Uh, you're in for a treat tonight, not in display of Latin, although I suppose he could and none of it, most of us wouldn't understand. Um, but dealing with the issues, why, why do we teach this subject? Why is St. Andrew, a St. Andrew's college student going to study this, these two uh, languages, uh, dead languages for uh, the great majority of the time they're at St. Andrew's College. So I'm gonna let you take it away, Mr. Davis, uh, and please um, give him your attention. And don't forget, please participate as much as you can. Zoom is a hard classroom situation to live in and to teach in. Mr. Davis? Well, I'd like to speak tonight on why should we bother studying ancient Greek and Latin. And those of you who have been students of mine probably already have a sense of why that's important. But I would like to begin with a bit broader question. Uh, those of you who have not been students of mine, and I see a few in here, how many of you have studied some foreign language? Okay, Mr. Bergstrom says he has. What have you studied? I'm so sorry, you're catching me uh, in the middle of my not full attention. I have studied Spanish. Spanish? Um, yeah, which I okay. took multiple years of. Multiple years of it. Well, that's good because my next question was going to be how long you studied it for. What have you done with Spanish? Um, I have taken trips and which uh, doing immersive language study was definitely incredibly helpful for gauging and understanding the language contextually inside of the classroom. Also, I have relatives that are from Latin American countries. And so getting to speak with them has been fun. So um, besides the, the three, two, three years that I studied Spanish inside of a classroom, uh, it's been a lot of extracurricular things. Would you say that Spanish is something that you interact with or think about on a daily basis? Uh, in my line of work, yes, because I work in the coffee industry uh, and they're and the big portion of people in the coffee industry are from Latin America, as well as I have a coworker who's Colombian. So it's kind of fun playing the uh, interbilingual game with him um during the day and but long, that is a weird experience for the most part i feel how long was it would you say in terms of your studies before you felt like it was paying off oh ah still it's still very much like a learning curve there are certain things where um i feel like i've only cracked the surface for a lot of a lot of it. Um, it's kind of one of those things that you slowly begin to appreciate. Like in your first classes, you it's you know stark. This is true. This is not true. This is how you say this. This is not how you say this. And then, as I've especially in the last few years, getting to talk to native speakers a lot, and you're like, oh, this is how I learned how to phrase it. And they're like, oh, you sound like an idiot. Like that's like the nuance of the language is just deeper and deeper and deeper, which you don't appreciate until you start trying to speak it on a regular basis. So I hear this theme of conversationalism uh, in your approach to Spanish. <laughs> and I wanna come back to that later in uh, my lecture, but is there anybody else who might venture a response to this question who has studied another uh, foreign language? I want to ask Miss Abby, because of course she was not a student of mine um, to everyone's great chagrin. And I know that she must have had some Latin at St. Andrews. But did you have anything else, Abby? I mean, I did a couple of years of Greek and then a few years of Latin, but it was a very long time ago. So I can't say that I've used it, it was a very daily since then. Have used it daily. And so let me ask you a follow-up question. What does using it daily look like to you? Well, I mean, I, I haven't used it daily, but um, there's definitely, um, like every now and then, Father Fuchs will ask me what a word means, and I can guess at what it means because I have taken Latin and Greek, so I kind of know root words, and I can infer 
but besides that it hasn't hasn't taken up too much I don't know <laughs> that's, that's that's quite fair so when asked a similar question uh, concerning the state of language education in England Winston Churchill once remarked he says quote naturally I'm biased in favor of children learning English I would make them all learn English and then I would let the clever ones learn Latin as an honor and Greek as a treat. So we talk about these two languages, Latin and Greek. And I think for many people uh, today, they are associated with thoughts of irrelevance and confusion. Uh, for example, when faced with something unintelligible, uh, a man of a certain knavish character might say, it's all Greek to me. Or if asked about Latin, we might hear someone give that odd pejorative, why bother? It's a dead language after all. And some of you, uh, like Emma, may have heard this lovely little poem that makes the rounds sometimes. Latin is a language as dead as dead can be. First it killed the Romans and now it's killing me. So why should we bother with either of these ancient and seemingly irrelevant tongues in our modern technological world? Any thoughts? I think one thing is when you learn to speak a language, you also learn about how a group of people thinks learn how the will think that's a good answer anybody else i mean i think um they're both romance languages so a lot of our language stems from them hmm. or at least latin is but i don't know <laughs> anybody else Well, let me venture to say, the answer is quite simply because the entirety of our Western civilization, the patterns of thought that we take for granted, the assumptions we make concerning the logical order of the cosmos, our very notions of science and mathematics, even the way we speak of time, we use for, uh, uh, doesn't matter such as AM or PM, derive entirely from concepts endemic to the Greek and Latin languages. Uh, it has been said that Greek and Latin are the languages in which wisdom herself is as it were cloaked in a vesture of gold. So if we want to understand who we are, we must discover the fundamental principles on which our culture rests. And this is indeed at the heart of all education. One of the most effective ways of building strong fundamentals in students is by preparing them for the future and, and looking at the past in order to do that. So I would argue to you that studying Latin and Greek is important because it will help students think more logically, communicate more effectively, and have a more comprehensive understanding of the world around them. Now, who might venture a guess as to when or how Greek first came to prominence? Well, I will tell you. The Greek language we know first really came on the scene in any kind of global sense with uh, Alexander the Great in the fourth century BC. You will recall that he conquered the Mediterranean world as it was at that time. And as a result of that, he imposed Greek thought, language and culture all across the known world. And so the ideas of the philosophers, which were so instrumental in shaping our present Western world were so inextricably bound up with that language that one could argue rightly that Greek became the language par excellence of philosophy, and it owed that universal prestige to the efforts of Alexander the Great. What's more interesting, perhaps, is that Greek 
uh, held such cultural currency that even the Hebrews, those uh, forebears of us that we think of as stalwarts of oral tradition in the ancient world recognized the value of this language. And so in the third century BC, uh, themselves being under the sway of Alexander, uh, they gathered together 70 Jewish scholars who were tasked with translating the ancient Hebrew Torah and followed shortly thereafter by the wisdom and prophetic books of the Old Covenant into Greek. And as the rabbinical story goes, each of these 70 scholars was given a manuscript of the Hebrew and they went about separately translating. After some time, when they had all reconvened to examine their respective works, it was discovered that each scholar had miraculously produced identical translations. And this was soon seen as an act of divine inspiration and the so-called Septuagint or the translation of the 70 quickly became the dominant version of the scriptures used amongst the Jews. In fact, the Hebrew scriptures fell into somewhat obscurity in terms of their common use for 9,000 years after that point. And so by the time of Christ, Greek was the language of commerce and business. It was the lingua franca of its time. And with the exception of St. Matthew's gospel, each of the New Testament books were originally written in the common dialect of Greek spoken among the populace. Indeed, what's particularly fascinating is that almost every quotation of the Old Testament scriptures in the New Testament references the Greek Septuagint, not the Hebrew original. Now, as the church progresses, we get into what we call the sub-apostolic period. Uh, those men and leaders who were tutored under the apostles and came immediately after them. And by that point, we see that Greek showed itself uniquely suited to the work of theological conceptualization that was being undertaken by the nascent Christian church. The first Christian liturgies were in Greek, and the early fathers and bishops took advantage of Greeks' universality to spread the gospel throughout the known world. And let me ask you a question. Do you have any idea why it might be, aside from the utility of it, in terms of it being a common language, that Greek may have shown itself useful for early theological development? especially those of you who have studied some Greek, might you venture an idea? It, I think Greek had a lot of those words, uh, those philosophical words, you know, that expressed concepts that, you know, may have only been able to have been expressed in Greek. Um, I'm maybe one example uh, would be logos, you know, which, you know, word is, you know, close, but it's like, it's not quite there. Um, as logos is, you know, uh, more somehow or, or closer. That's a good thought. Uh, and then so uh, with theology, then we would want those, you know, um, uh, full words from, from the Greek. Perhaps uh, precision is a word you're, you're, you're getting at there. Something else from my studies of Hebrew is, so English is a very descriptive language. It has, I think, over like 20,000 words or 100,000 words. I can't remember. Whereas Hebrew is a much more um, uh, metaphorical language almost might be a good way of putting it, where words carry lots of other meanings, like nefesh means throat, but it also means soul. And I think Greek does a really good job of, of paralleling that in a lot of ways. And that, like you were talking about, logos is this idea that means word, but it also means a lot of other things. So it's able to communicate nuance, but also the interconnectedness that, that the, it was kind of began in the ethos of the Hebrew text. That'd be my thought. That's a good thought. And it relates to the Greek. And, and in fact, this is what we see happening. 
um, by the fourth century AD, the church, as she was coming into her own, uh, sort of coming above ground, as it were, uh, she was wrestling with the truths of the faith and found Greek particularly appropriate for expressing the peculiarities of God's being and the nature of Christ. I think in particular, when we talk about the nature of Christ, one of the great debates that illustrates uh, the precision of Greek was between uh, what we would refer to as Christ's nature being homoousius or homoousius. And what's interesting about this debate, whether, whether Christ is equal to or equal substance with the Father or similar substance with the Father is the difference of one letter in Greek. It's a very precise language and so it was able to specifically state exactly what the church understood. Now, as history progresses, what we see happen is that in much of the Greek speaking territory, as we go into the fifth and sixth and seventh centuries, we enter, enter into a certain dark age of Islamic conquest throughout Byzantium and North Africa and the Middle East. But what's interesting about this is the Muslim scholars revered and preserved the ancient Greek writings they came across. Uh, and indeed, nearly the whole of Islamic art, architecture, literature, philosophy, and even many of their technical achievements were built on the ancient knowledge of the Greeks that they discovered as they moved into these strongholds such as uh, Alexandria and elsewhere where Greek thought had been quite prevalent. And indeed, the Byzantine Empire, which was, of course, as many of you know, those of you particularly who had history with me, uh, that eastern half of the old Roman Empire that was centered in Constantinople, uh, it was sort of refracted through Hellenistic culture. And the Byzantine Empire survived as a beacon of Greek language and culture until its collapse in 1453, nearly a thousand years after Rome in the West fell. So we see that, that Greek, even though it, it, it for a time was subjugated, shall we say, under quite a foreign culture, that of uh, the Muslims, it still continued to hold this influence very directly. But what of Latin? Is Latin, as is often referred to, a dead language that disappeared 2000 years ago and holds no relevance for people in the 21st century? What say you? Lizzie is smiling. She has a thought, I think. I don't think so. No, she doesn't have a thought. Okay, I was incorrect. Uh, I don't think it's a dead language. Oh, you don't think it's a dead language. All right, why do you not think it's a dead language? Because we use it. I mean, I use it all the time. Because Lizzie uses it every day. She <laughs> wakes up thinking in Latin. That's, that's, <laughs> I'm so proud. Any other thoughts? Anybody else? Do you think that it's a dead language? It is very much alive in the church mm. and in theology. Very much alive in the church and theology. All right. Anybody else? I think we have to define terms a bit. Mm. Uh, yes. a, a dead language is commonly understood to be one that is not spoken conversationally. That's right. So before I give my answer, let's see if we can get to the heart of what this pejorative means. Does it mean to say it's a dead language? So I want to bring this around a little bit to what Mr. Bergstrom said earlier. Now today, we have this idea that the superiority of learning what we might call a living language one that is presently characterizes some socio-ethnic group, such as Chinese or Spanish, 
is that it will actually be used conversationally. But we have to acknowledge, particularly in America, the very few students pursue linguistic studies beyond whatever their initial academic language requirements might be. You think of many universities, uh, you might be required to take two semesters, or if you're lucky, four of some foreign language of your choice, and that's really it. And so moreover, even though conversational proficiency is always the ideal in these linguistic studies, very few students as a result actually achieve it. And so there's a good deal of learning that's happening that proves to be nearly useless because we don't see it all the way through. Have any of you studied some other foreign language like French or Spanish or some, some modern language for a semester or two and that was it? Or maybe you, you used Rosetta Stone or one of these things. Christopher Turney is shaking, is, is, is nodding his head. What, was, what language was it? Uh, well, I did, yeah, a little bit of French and I've taken, yeah, just, uh, I think it was just a semester or two of Spanish. Yeah, it was two semesters, just sort of as a requirement. So what, what benefit would you say in terms of your everyday life did those two semesters of Spanish give you? I mean, really not much. I mean, there's a few menu items I can identify and different pop culture references I understand. Uh, day to, I mean, day to day, probably a, just a general curiosity about languages because it was so little, it was so little. Um, so I'm going to guess that you would not venture to call yourself conversationally proficient. No, yeah. no, not okay. at all. All right. And that's a good point. Because living languages, again, languages that are currently part of some socio-ethnic group, depend upon conversational proficiency for their usefulness and value. But to the contrary, only a dead language, now I'm going to define that as a language that is no longer given to vicissitudes of meaning. Leslie, what does vicissitude mean? Living. Say, say it again. Living. Living, not living, Emma. Mm. This is going to illustrate a, a future point of mine. So vicissitude means constantly changing, always here or there or all about. Only a dead language that's free from that sort of thing can benefit a student, whether or not she achieves conversational proficiency. Now, I, I overheard Mr. Turney uh, mention a little while ago that he just recently saw a documentary, which I myself, also saw that it was entitled, What is a Woman? Now, the very fact that we can ask that question demonstrates the volatility of a living language. English is having a debate, at least in certain circles, about what a word like woman means. Now that's because it's alive, it's changing, it's subject to vicissitude. But Latin is not such a language. There is no socio-ethnic group that speaks Latin today and therefore subjects the language to a constant alteration in meaning over time. And so one of the first things we recognize when we study Latin is that most Latin curricula that one might come across do not preoccupy themselves with playing out social exchanges. Emma, how many times when you had Latin with me over those three glorious and wonderful years that I'm sure changed your life for the better, 
did we ever engage in conversation? In Latin? In Latin. She was, what, what she was. We would trying. say, salve magistrus. Ah, okay, so we'll have a there. greeting or so. Okay, a greeting. And usually this is how we teach most foreign languages today. One of the first things we'll teach somebody is to say, well, hello, how are you? My name is Lance. Bonjour, comment ça va? Je m'appelle Lance. Okay, great. But Latin students usually pretty early on wind up learning how to uh, read or say things like this. When the lady entered on the field of battle, she found all the relics of a bloody fight. The little valley was covered with slain men and horses and broken armor, besides many wounded who were now too weak to save themselves. Does that sound a little bit like some of the things that we may have done in my Latin classes, my former Latin students? Yes, yes. I would venture to say that very rarely did we ever ask times like, quid est tempus? Well, we, who cares what the time is? It's more interesting to talk about the battles, all right? So let me ask you the question again, now that we've made some definitions. Is Latin a dead language? All right, Emma says yes. I'm going to say perhaps, but allow me to quote G.K. Chesterton, who once said, a language must die to become immortal. I would posit to you that in transcending all living cultures and races, Latin is an eternal language. So we may think of the fall of Rome as seeing the end of a particular civilization and indeed the one that gave birth to the Latin language. But I would argue that it heralded a new beginning that would propel Latin to the foremost language in the history of the world. We know from history that Latin was the language of perhaps the greatest empire the world has ever known. Some of you might fight me on that and say it was England. I would entertain the fight in other venues. But suffice it to say, Latin united countless nations and tribes under the one authority of the city of Rome. But in God's providence, it became not only a means to evangelization once the church was born, but furthermore, its adoption by the church as her language meant that she could converse in the language of the state and thereby bring the state to Christ. Of its very nature, Latin is most suitable for promoting every form of culture among peoples. It gives rise to no jealousies. It does not favor any one nation, but presents itself with equal impartiality to all and is equally acceptable to all. We can look at any cursory overview of Western history and see this. Nor must we overlook the characteristic nobility of Latin's formal structure. It's concise, it has a varied and harmonious style which is full of majesty and dignity. Even to this day, the most important documents that we see fit to issue in our culture, whether they be documents of the state, documents of education, they are issued in the Latin tongue. And so Latin makes for singular clarity and impressiveness of expression. Bringing this around again then to this idea of it being a dead language, we can say that Latin is set and unchanging. It has long since ceased to be affected by the alterations in the meanings of words, which are the normal result of daily popular use. 
So what some Latin word meant 1500 years ago in the writings of St. Jerome, it means now with no diminution or variation. Furthermore, St. Thomas Aquinas defined wisdom as the ability to order things rightly. And I would suggest that the study of Latin does just that. Latin students of mine give me an example of why that might be so. Why might Latin help order things rightly? Well, I just think of the uh, all the exercises with declensions and conjugations, you know, over and over, um, and you know, just the, you know, if you were to classify a noun or a verb, there are you know seven or eight different, um, you know ways to describe that Latin word, you know, uh, declension, tense, uh, gender, um, the others. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's, uh, it's a system. It's totally sy systematized, uh, you know, like the Roman Empire. Um, and, uh, you know, you can chart, there, there, there are very few exceptions. I think in my Latin textbook, there was like two pages of exceptions, maybe three pages of exceptions. You know, English language, you could, you know, a thousand pages of exceptions. That's right, that's good. Latin is extremely highly organized and logical by its nature. And what we know is that because of this, Latin is an effective training for youthful minds. There is a reason that classical education and indeed even the public education of this country up until fairly recently understood the role for Latin instruction from a very young age. It exercises, matures and perfects the principal faculties of mind and spirit. It can also be shown that Latin sharpens the wits and gives keenness of judgment because of the exactness of its grammatical structure. It helps our mind to grasp things accurately and develop a sense of values. Uh, and from that, it can be used as a means for teaching highly intelligent thought and speech. Now, why might we say that Latin is useful for developing a sense of values? Any thoughts? Hmm. By values, do you mean similar to like the virtues or do you mean in a way of like what we hold dear and what we see as good and right? I would say all. Which might be, okay. Um, I think one of the things is like, as we, part of culture, the, the definition of culture that we were given in my anthropology classes, the way that people do things, the way that people do things around here. Um, and if you develop a culture, or like a uh, like the social, if the social milieu is specificity and thoughtfulness and exactness, if the way that even and the, what I spoke before, how a when you learn about a language, you learn about how people thinks because it shows the thought process that you and the the ideas and structures that you have to work with. And so with Latin, giving you those structures of exactness and specificity, and if you don't speak correctly, you'll confuse people that you're speaking to. It requires a, an, an aspect of thoughtfulness, which hopefully then will pervade into the rest of the way that you do things. That's a good answer. 
Latin is very precise and exact. And because of that, it requires us to develop a sense of precision in our thinking. And furthermore, Latin is a holistic language, meaning that the entirety of the sentence conveys the thought. Unlike English, where we think I've got one word followed in the correct order by the next word and complete thought be formed before the sentence can be constructed. So it forces us in terms of our value to inculcate this sense of holistic thinking. We need to work through our thought before we express our thought. English has this uh, lovely quality, and I say that not at all dripping of sarcasm, where we can say a word, um, say the next word, and formulate our thought very slowly and gradually as we try to get the sentence out. Latin does not allow us to do that. Requires a certain sense of reflection. So this is why I say that Latin is important for teaching us intelligent thought and speech. Now, coming out of that, if we might say that Greek is the father of philosophy, so the father of, of thought, perhaps, I would say to you that Latin is the mother of oratory. From her, as was mentioned earlier, nearly all the European languages are given birth. French, Spanish, Romanian, Portuguese, Italian, even the non-Romance languages like German uh, find a great deal of reference in Latin. And so if one wishes to study these languages, having a knowledge of Latin will ease this process considerably. Even in English, which we still uh, insist on referring to as being a Germanic language, is really not quite true. There was a point in time when that was the case. But today, English owes most of its vocabulary to Latin. 55% of all English words and 90% of all two-syllable English words come directly from Latin. Uh, Theodore Geisel, Dr. Seuss, once remarked, Latin allows you to adore words, take them apart, and find out where they come from. So one of my favorite examples that I've used with uh, some of you before in class is that marvelous collect for Whitsunday found in the BCP and I think uh, familiar to all of us. Grant us by the same spirit to have a right judgment in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort. Now, when you hear the word comfort, what comes to mind? Some of you might think down pillows and wool blankets. Others like Emma might think a cup of tea in front of a warm fire. And these are charming thoughts, but Maybe that's not exactly the primary mission of the Holy Ghost that we're asking for in this college. So Latin students, do you venture to have something you can contribute to me about what comfort might actually mean? Um, for, I think it comes from fortis, which means strength. And then Whenever I see C-O or C-O-M, I always think with or companionship. So I think it would be the Holy Spirit coming to strengthen us with, within us. That is correct. It derives from a verb, a verb confortare in Latin, which literally means to wax strong or take courage, literally to, to strengthen with. So we get a rather different idea than that of our English understanding of comfort, which might imply some sort of slumber or somnolence. And somnolence being another word 
that we could learn the definition of if we have a keen sense of Latin. So knowing all of this, we can see that Latin affects positively the way we create discourse in English, and it helps us to express ourselves with more effectiveness and, and confidence. Also, Latin grammar teaches us how to coordinate ideas, how to reflect on various ways to say the same thing, and thus to write and speak better in English. When you get this idea of holistic thought and of arranging of words in such a way to bring emphasis to them in Latin, we can parlay a lot of that into English and come up with much nicer writing. And indeed, you will find that most of the great English writers throughout history were quite well trained in Latin. There's no, co there, there's no coincidence there. Now, as college students, there's always the question of avocation. Well, I've got to eventually get a job and make money. At least that's what my culture tells me. So what can Latin do for that? Well, first of all, I'd say Latin is the key to the vocabulary of medicine, law, and science. In a recent article of the Princeton Review, we were told that, quote, according to the Association of American Medical Colleges, students who major or double major in classics have a better success rate of getting into medical school then do students who concentrate solely in biology, microbiology, or other branches of science. Let that sink in for a moment. Studying this so-called dead language produces more effective medical students than does biology. That might lend some explanation Mr. Turney, to why we are suddenly plagued with the pandemic of the question, what is a woman? Now, for a prospective lawyer, the National Jurist Magazine tells us, quote, that the law school applicants with the highest grade point averages and LSAT scores were those who studied the classics in college. Well, of course, even a cursory reflection on law will show terms like habeas corpus. The entirety of legal vocabulary is centered in the notion of Latin. Mathematics, the science of numbers, is also entirely dependent on the grammar and vocabulary of Latin. Now we think of math as being systematic, organized, orderly, and cumulative. Each skill that we learn builds upon the previous one and nothing can be forgotten and everything must be remembered. All knowledge is interrelated. Latin students, does that sound familiar? It works the same way with Latin. And in this case, the presence of Latin strengthens the study of math. Now, not to downplay the importance of math, but I would submit to you that the study of math is still secondary to Latin. Why? Any venture to a guess? I'm guess guessing Mrs. Waterman is not here. So I won't have to suffer any wrath. Well, let me suggest to you that even though mathematics deals with numbers, the concepts thereof are taught in words, right? We've all taken math classes. And nearly all the words that we use in mathematics are Latin derivatives calculate, cardinal, denominator, exponent, percent, tangent, 
if we wish to be good mathematicians, we should start by being good Latinists. And lest I neglect to mention that whereas Latin may lend the vocabulary, it was the Greeks who discovered many of our mathematical concepts, Archimedes, Pythagoras, and Euclid, to name a few. So the study of Latin compels students to dive deeper into the architecture of language itself. With Latin, one can peer beneath the surface and see how words, phrases, and sentences are built and linked together. In our childhood days, when we were learning our native languages, words often had an abstract character. They were comparable to mathematical symbols. But now, once we've studied Latin, these words and concepts take on an anatomy. So this is why, unlike the study of living languages, it is not necessary to gain conversational fluency in Latin in order to reap massive rewards, although it is possible to do that today. But you will derive greater conceptual knowledge from two years of Latin than you will from two years of any modern language. So we often hear it said there's no sense in taking only one semester in German or French. Chris, we talked about that with your class earlier. And why? Because the benefit of those languages is derived from fluency in them. But even a single semester of Latin has immediate rewards. And these are only compounded the further one's studies go. And of course, uh, in the collegiate model for St. Andrews, the opportunity will be to study Latin and Greek full time for four years. So to bring this all the way back to the first question we asked about Latin, it may indeed be a dead language but only in the eyes of a dead mind. So I'd like then to come to uh, our final and for me, perhaps most distinctive reason for learning Latin and Greek, uh, and particularly within our context at St. Andrews. And for this, we need to turn to the scriptures. Uh, beginning at the 17th verse of the 19th chapter of the gospel according to St. John. And Jesus, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two other with him on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Do you think that there might be something that happens if one comes in contact with the cross. Uh, what do you mean? Like, if you were there or, or us now? Let me ask you a, another question. Why was Jesus baptized? Was he baptized to be made regenerate as we are? He, he sanctified the waters. Wait, say, oops, say it again. Who said that? Say it again. Uh, I said he sanctified the waters. Uh -huh. The waters did not sanctify him. When he entered into the waters, as the fathers tell us, he sanctified the waters, making them efficacious to us. He transformed this 
this um, physical substance in creation. I would posit to you that when St. John tells us that the language on the cross was Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, there's more to this than just a statement of historical fact. For Christians, particularly Latin and Greek, have been sanctified by the blood of the lamb and the wood of the cross. It is not coincidental that these two sister languages conquered the whole world for Christ, East and West. And Mr. Bergstrom, I will not leave you out. Hebrew, of course, is on there as well. The greatest theological thoughts ever written were done in these two languages. The most ancient and beautiful liturgies of the church throughout the world from her very beginning and still in existence and practice today were and are sung in Greek and Latin. So one might rightly argue that Latin and Greek are truly sacramental. They are means of grace. We cannot truly and deeply know our faith our history, our forefathers, if we do not know the languages in which our great dogmas took shape and the unutterable mysteries of heaven were clothed with speech. Indeed, as Chris pointed out earlier, the most profound of all Christian theology, the heart of the faith, the incarnation of the eternal logos, is revealed most clearly in the freedom of Greek thought. Nearly the entire corpus of Christian music in the West was composed in Latin, derived from the ancient and venerable translation of the scriptures that we know as the Vulgate. The very psalms sung even to this day in Benedictine monasteries are identical with the Latin words sung by St. Benedict himself in the fifth century with no change of meaning. So Latin, I would submit to you, is the great unifier. It bridges the gulf of history and gives a consistent liturgical and theological speech to every generation. And it is no accident that as Christians began abandoning the use and study of Latin in the mid 20th century, our comprehension of the faith has deteriorated and divisions have multiplied. Now we are in a deplorable state that C.S. Lewis called, quote, the second death of ancient learning. He remarks, if one were looking for a man who could not read Virgil, although his father could, he might be found more easily in the 20th century than the fifth. So if we wish to see a second renaissance in our culture and our church, we must with vigor enter upon those studies which were so characteristic of the glories and triumphs of Christian civilization. And I will close with these words as the psalmist declares, in omnem terram exivit sonus eorum, et in fines orbis terrae verba eorum. Their sound is gone out into all lands and their words into the ends of the world. Any questions or thoughts, rebukes, clarifications? I mean, that is an that is just an amazing claim, uh, and uh, you know something I've never heard before that that you know Hebrew, Greek, and Latin could be uh sacramental or or sacraments um 
I, I mean, an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. You know, can a whole language be that? Um, I just, could you say a little more about that? Uh, that's just amazing to me. Let me interrupt for a moment if I can, Mr. Davis. Yes. Um, keep in mind that a sacramental is understood, Mr. Turney, as something that bears resemblance to the sacraments as delivered by Jesus and the apostles in the church. Uh, so I don't know that he's saying, you know, we're adding an eighth sacrament to the list, but I think he's using the term, correct me if I'm wrong, of, of sacramental. And this is not unusual in the history of the church. I mean, as recently as um, Alexander Schmemann in his book, For the Life of the World, he talks a lot about the entire world being a sacrament to God. Um, and uh, Hans Borsma, a more recent author, uh, speaks very similar language that the earth is meant to be a sacrament for man to even then offer up to God. Um, and so, Mr. Davis, take this and run with it and finish answering Chris's question, but it, it would it be um, maybe not analogous, but similar to say that there, uh, I, I was thinking sort of a sanctified language, like these languages be, have become sanctified or set apart in some way for the use of the church and of, of God in the world. That's right. And so we see in, in 1 Corinthians 15 that St. Paul gives a sort of grand image of, of the end of all things and what it will look like. And he says that the, the final thing is that Christ, God, will be all in all. Everything, in some sense, will have been united and perfected in Christ. And so I would say that when we look at the Gospels, what do we see? Everything that comes into contact with our Lord is transformed. The blind are made to see, the lame are made to walk, the waters are sanctified. We talk about the very wood of the cross itself. I mean, of course, we know that uh, we have the great story of, of St. Helena finding the true cross and, and the many miracles that were associated with the very wood that absorbed the blood of God. So we see all throughout Christian history, this idea that the incarnation is affecting everything because what's going to happen in the end? There will be the new heavens and the new earth. Everything will be restored and renewed in Acts. We talk about the restoration of all things. That's what we're all looking forward to. And so I would submit to you that very early on, the church recognized that this also occurs in language. Now, it is significant. Uh, what is perhaps the first major event in the scriptures after the flood? Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel, when the languages were confused and they were no longer able to ascend up to God. What is the first gift of the Holy Ghost given to the apostles? On Pentecost. Tongues of fire. Tongues. They spake in other tongues. And that was, in fact, all throughout Acts. We see converts had the laying on of hands for the Holy Ghost, and they speak in new tongues. And what we know about this, among all the things we don't know, is that however this worked, whatever this was, they're speaking these tongues, but everybody else is hearing them as one. It was, it was the reverse of the Tower of Babel. It was the restoration of unity brought about by the gospel. And so as the church developed and grew, we know that uh, Greek, of course, very early on was, was useful for its theological precision and such. But what's interesting is even as the Greek continued to be used for that, very quickly in the West, 
Latin became the dominant language of the church's liturgy. Now that's interesting because language was, or excuse me, Latin was not the common tongue. It was the language of the state and the aristocracy. Greek was the common tongue. So in this sort of strange situation, the common tongue becomes the means whereby in the great councils uh, and amongst the Greek fathers, we have all this deep and rich theology worked out and the dogmatics proclaimed, but in the language of worship, the place where we actually encounter God amongst us, this highly elevated language of the elite, shall we say, is applied. And what's even more interesting is that the, the Christian development of Latin from the beginning was an elevated form of that Latin. So think of it by analogy to our English in the prayer book. We all know what it means, generally, but we don't speak that way. And that's how Christian Latin was from the beginning. And we know that it developed that way because there was a sense that when we came together for corporate worship, we were one, continuing Pentecost, and two, we were spreading the kingdom. But now, as the church is solidified and it becomes a more public entity, and more and more converts are swelling in, you've got people from all over this imperial world. Uh, initially, we just mostly had Jews. And then, of course, with St. Paul, we, we start to see the Gentiles come in. And then increasingly, as Rome begins to collapse, more and more the Gentiles, the pagans come in. And in every single case, they are brought in not to a vernacular worship, but to a Latin worship because the idea was that the Latin language conveyed the unity of heaven. It, it was a universal tongue that everybody, regardless of what their cultural beliefs were or what their own languages were, could enter into and become part of and allow it to transform them. And so we see here this transcendental element because obviously not everybody immediately had some perfect fluency in Latin. But it was seen that worship could be conveyed through this, just like worship was conveyed in some sense to the tongues of the apostles as the Holy Ghost gave them utterance. So St. Thomas Aquinas uh, by the 11th and 12th century, he goes into great length to defend this idea that what we see is now by his point, you've got a thousand years of this language being used in the cult of God and the worship of God. And that by the very nature of the language itself, not only coming into contact with the cross, but then being the very words through which God's presence is brought into the world of the Holy Communion, hoc est enim corpus meum, over and over and over again, the Eucharistic words uttered in the language of the very empire that had sought to kill the Christians and exterminate the faith, we see this great salvation has taken place. God took those things that were meant for evil to his people and turned them into the means whereby the entire Western world was converted. And so Latin can serve us again today, I think, and this is a great irony of our multicultural globalist world, that the one time in history where you might think, particularly when it comes to issues of uh, worship and theological discourse, we might benefit from a common tongue that can cut through all of the confusion. And yet we are more adamant than we've ever been in history that we can't even entertain such a thought. Everybody must be entitled to do everything in their own vernacular. And so we have confusion. We of course see this lamentably even as the church herself developed in the, in the mid to late uh, medieval period. As we had the Islamic conquest in the East, 
Unfortunately, much of the communication and interaction between the two halves of the empire became difficult. And so the Greek thought of the East that was increasingly under threat from the Muslims was further removed from the Latin thought of the West. And so terminology that had originally um, had discourse between the two languages and cultures increasingly grew apart. And so we got to this point where the West was speaking Latin and the Greek, was, the East was speaking Greek and ne'er the twain shall meet. And we had unfortunately, lamentably, this schism between the two halves of the church that I would argue is almost entirely predicated on language. Because the theological concepts for the most part weren't really what was in question. It was misunderstandings because there was no longer a common tongue in which to discourse and worship. So I think it's important that we as Christians recognize that though maybe we do not have to go wholesale you know, to doing every last bit of our liturgies, for example, in Latin, but we might be accustomed, for example, to singing Lord have mercy upon us in the mass. But of course, for the Chinese speaker, that doesn't mean anything. But what if we were to say, well, maybe at least these sort of principal and very historic parts, we all began intentionally to learn in their original language again. Maybe both the American and the Chinese could both say Kyrie eleison, and neither one of them have to give up their own culture. Maybe our, our concerns today about cultural or linguistic imperialism would actually be overcome if we said, no, we're going to go with the dead language the one that no culture can claim specifically as its own, the universal language. And maybe we could start to re-evangelize the world by recognizing that Christ can communicate his grace through the very words that have been sung in his praises for 2000 years. Does that answer your question a bit? Something that's also interesting to me just in continuing this idea is the reality that there's the general revelation of, of God in, in nature, but there's a beauty of the specific revelation of God, which he condescends. He comes down and he speaks using words and he chooses words to communicate his nature so that we might know him and who he is specifically, not just some general idea that even as close as Plato and Socrates and Aristotle can get, you know, there's, there's this aspect of intimate knowledge that word allows for. And Jesus being the logos, there's this importance of like specificity as you talk about like in how, how we talk about this God who has himself revealed himself to us through words. So being intentional then when we offer those words back to him, um, in the language that we use, which is one of the incredible benefits of the prayer book. I forget where it is, but the, the point that we don't have to think about what someone is praying and we can just fully offer our yes and amen because we know that it is, that it is good and kind of breaching that cross-cultural bounds. If God is the word and he has offered to us his knowledge through the, through the word being Jesus, how then do we, how do we offer those words back? Well, exactly. And of, and of course, we can't forget that as Christians, we have an entire heritage pre-Christ that has this exact same idea. The Hebrews believed, I mean, some of the rabbis even taught that the original language in the garden was Hebrew. Now, we don't know that, of course, but the point is still well made that the Hebrew language was intimately bound up with the revelation of God. And in some sense, you couldn't separate them. And so even when we see the, the Jews take on the Septuagint and the Greek translations of the scriptures, they still worship in Hebrew, even if they're studying their scripture in what became a vernacular for them. And they're still teaching their children to read the Hebrew. 
So there's a sense that God manifests himself in that. Uh, when St. Paul talks about in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, St. Augustine argues, and partly what that means is that at that time period, you had the perfect confluence of Greek thought and philosophy and Latin language, and that those two things together in that cultural interplay are what allowed the gospel to spread throughout the world. And that therefore, Augustine argued, those two things were necessary. That we could not separate the Christian faith from its Greek thought and its Latin language. Even when we get to the Protestant Reformation on the continent, all the continental reformers initially uh, wrote and, and discoursed and spread their ideas in Latin. I will recall to you that Luther's theses, which those of you who studied your history know he never intended to be for public consumption. They were meant only for private discourse at Wittenberg, but a certain someone made copies of them and translated them into German, but they had to translate them. Why? Because Luther posted them in Latin. It was meant to be a theological discourse within the community of the church. Calvin initially wrote his institutes in Latin. So we can debate the finer points of their theology, but I think we see a bigger point here. Even they were trying at least to work within the linguistic and thought structure of the church. Luther in particular uh, loved the Greek fathers. We see this in our own tradition. Uh, Lancelot Andrews, uh, if you ever have seen uh, original copies of his private devotions, uh, they are chock full of Latin and Greek compositions. So it's part of our heritage and I would argue it's, it's, it's an essential one. And so it, it behooves us um, as part of our Christian formation, not only our intellectual formation, to study these languages, to have a better sense of our faith, where it comes from, and indeed, I think, to have a better grasp of prayer and relationship to the way the church has approached God throughout our history. I hate to cut it off, but we are out of time. Mr. Davis, thank you so much. I think everyone's enjoyed the conversation and uh, the information. Um, I'm ready to take out my grammars and get back to studying languages. Okay, maybe not, but um, I, knew, I knew that I hadn't studied enough and was suddenly becoming older with family and kids and teaching too many other classes. So. Um, I am very glad that so many of my students have been able to spend some time in Latin and Greek. And um, thank you all for being here. Um, we do have, I, I, I misspoke last week. So a uh, visiting professor from Patrick Henry College, Roberta Baer, Dr. Roberta Baer, uh, will be uh, teaching on uh, chapter two of the abolition of man. Um, what does it mean to be human is, is close to the title. Uh, so looking forward to that. I am, um, I am considering scheduling just a very practical Q&A about St. Andrew's College uh, following that. So those of you that have been here more than a couple times, please give me some, some feedback if something like that would be uh, of interest and we can discuss very practical things like we won't ask Chris to tell us how much snow you might have to shovel if we get a big storm. Um, but anyways, thank you. God bless you. And Mr. Davis, I know it's late there. Get some sleep. Good night.